to look at the big picture, when you see a rocket left the rock from its launch pad, this captures the fundamental principle of what we call a hot launch. And this is basically when the projectile relies on its own engine ignition for thrust. This is a very well established reliable technique and it has a high thrust to weight ratio. However, it causes a lot of mechanical and thermal stress on both the rocket and the launch pad. And this is something we can't afford in our deep space transfer vehicle because we're launching the SM vehicle from a lander. So if we do a direct hot launch, it would actually self-destruct. So what we propose instead is a cold launch system, which is propelling the projectile uh, using the external forces without proper propulsion. Uh, the most common forces in uh, cold launches are pneumatic and electromagnetic forces. Uh, what this does is that it gives uh, the ascent vehicle enough vertical offset for it to ignite its fuel subsequently. Subsequ uh, and this protects it from any uh, heat damage caused by a direct fall launch. The perfect example of how the cold launch was used in a Mars sample return mission was NASA's Vector, which you can see in the video. Um, they propelled the projectile a few meters in the air before it starts igniting its fuel. And this is ultimately the inspiration behind our cold launch system for our deep space uh, transfer vehicle. Uh, so our deep space transfer vehicle has a lander and an ascent vehicle. Uh, the ascent vehicle is uh, 298 kilograms and the goal would be to propel it around two meters vertically before it ignites its launch What we propose is an electromagnetic cold launch system. This would compose of an armature coil, which is the moving coil in our system, and this is wrapped around the projectile, and a stationary uh, stator coil. This is going to be connected to a capacitor. Uh, this is more compact than a pneumatic system, and it also has a more stable performance under uh, changes in atmospheric pressure, and it has accurate acceleration control uh, through simulations. So our induction coil gun, which is another name for our electromagnetic launcher, is multi-stage, meaning we have uh, four, uh, we choose four steering coils, and uh, each one is connected to its own capacitor, and they discharge uh, sequentially to propel the armature. Now we want the induction coil gun to fit inside our DSTV. Uh, we want the steering coil to have a maximum height of around 0.975 uh, meters. Uh, and this is actually not the conventional coil gun um, architecture because usually the projectile is like fully immersed uh, inside the stator, but in our case we have the ascent vehicle uh, with a much further height. Uh, so the objective of our research would be to build a model uh, in a computationally efficient way, and that would be uh, in a 2D axis-metric form. And the reason why this is uh, feasible for us is because uh, it, it's a co uh configuration. So we would be able to build a 2D axis-metric model uh, and perform finite element analysis, and based on that, we would be able to simulate the mutual inductances between uh, the stator coils and the armature coils. Uh, and after we simulate, we can then optimize our design and discuss a feasible control system. So, uh, in order to simulate our model, we have to understand the governing equations. Um, when a capacitor discharges inside the stator, a current flows in it, IS, and this induces current in the opposite direction in the armature, IA, which uh, induces an electromagnetic force. Um, on the armature, and that force is directly proportional to the currents, as well as the mutual inductance gradient uh, between the two coils. Um, and the, the total force on the armature would be the sum of each contribution of each stator coil for each stage. So in order to calculate the mutual inductance gradient, uh, we first get the mutual inductance uh, using the following equation, and this accounts for every Term in the stator relative to every term in the armature. And once we get that, we want to see how that changes as the armature position changes with respect to the stator. This would allow us to solve for the differential equation, which basically governs the system dynamics. It 
uh, would allow us to get uh, the changing current over time and hence the force and displacement of the other time. Now, uh, we are going to be building the 2D isosymmetric model on a finite element that the magnetics work into, which is actually an open source software. However, this software actually only works for magnetostatic or harmonic uh, simulations, but our case is a transient simulation because we're dealing with capacitor discharge. Um, so, the fact that the mutual inductance gradient is with respect to the armature position would allow us to use external code integrated with the software um, to extract how the mutual inductance changes relative to the armature position. So what we're doing essentially is that we're sweeping the armature across the discrete position, the discrete positions and we're extracting the mutual inductance for each position. After we do that, we would direct the currents and force in this given amount of time. In order to test if our software is valid, we did literature compar comparisons. Uh, we rebuilt model, uh, a model of a multi-stage induction coil gun in Bohar Bands et al.'s multi-stage coil gun. Um, and we found that the uh, extractive mutual inductances were pretty much the same. And so were the, the post-process Currents, armature and stator currents, as well as the resulting force and positive velocity. So um, now that we validated our software is working, we want to optimize our induction for the uh, design. One way of doing it is by uh, testing different armature designs. So for the same armature mass, uh, you can have higher height by having lower layers, like more trends, less layers. And we actually found that having a uh, uh, armature height that's greater than the stator height um, improved the performance drastically. And this is because more cross-sectional area of the armature is exposed to the magnetic flux. Another way of optimization is testing different armature initial positions. Now the reason why an initial position matters is because you want to discharge in the stator coil at a time where the mutual inductance is in the mutual induction gradient is in the right direction and is at a peak value. That way you're ensuring that the force is in the right direction and it's also uh, as big as possible on the armature. And this is the same reason why this is the same reason why um, when we fire the subsequent stages is just as important because again you want to fire in the optimal position where mutual induction gradient is high. This is like this is just a plot showing oh if you don't optimize the stator ignition sequence, you can see the force is drastically affected by that. So for our initial parameters, uh, we base our initial uh, estimate for our design in which we want to optimize uh, based on literature for heavy projectiles. Um, and we find something for our own DSTV to fit inside the design requirements. And the results were um, the following mutual inductances over our mutual position using the gun software. And these were the post process of currents and for, uh, velocity and displacement over time. Now, as you can see, we actually did manage to achieve the two meter vertical offset we wanted to achieve using the 8 millipound capacitor is charged to 4 kilovolts. Um, and this was actually the results after uh, stator emission sequence optimization and armature initial position op uh, optimization. Now, we also want to optimize the armature design, so we tested on uh, armature with higher height and like less turns, uh, less layers, sorry. Uh, and what this did is that it actually significantly improved the performance. Uh, for the same capacitor charge, it actually gave a displacement of around 12 meters uh, instead of 2.3 meters from the initial armature design, which was had the same exact mass. So this is a significant improvement. And because we only want two meters for our DSTV, we reduce the energy needed for the capacitors. Now to actually deploy this in a real system, we also want to discuss very briefly the control system needed. Um, we would um, basically use a microcontroller to be able to ignite the stator sequence uh, in the correct optimized time we derived from our simulation. Uh, where we would be using an SVM32 board with Kyle uh, Vision. Uh, and we would also be controlling the switching of the stators using line shaping pliers. Uh, now, the reason why they're very uh, beneficial is because they can handle the kilo volts and kilo amperes we're dealing with in our system, and they're also light.
by triggered, which means there's complete separation between the control system and the, uh, the launch system, uh, which would protect the components of the control system. So essentially, the microcontroller would be activating the infrared uh, LED uh, to control or to switch on the light trigger. So the takeaways is that we would be able to launch our DSTV uh, a very low set of two meters, and we were able to simulate the system dynamics using an open source uh, software with our circuit like coding. Uh, and we explored smarter armature geometry and ultimacy requirement, as well as armature and shift position. Uh, and then we looked at the control system that we use for our case. The next step would obviously to build a prototype system, let us make a prototype to validate everything that's important. Um, I would like to thank uh, Mr. Michael Koshak, President of Princeton Satellite Systems, who has been an incredible mentor, and the Dr. Chris Delia, who helped me understand the complex physics of the system, and Joe Small, Vice President, who's been 